Um, thank you very much for joining us for the first of our Hope Farm webinars um, for this year. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, so just going through a few housekeeping points before we get to it. Um, it you won't be able to turn on your video, your microphone, but you can ask questions about the talks um, via a Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Um, please do ask plenty of questions as we have time allocated at the end of the session to answer those. Um, although we have no chat function available for the event. Um, if you have any technical issues, there is someone from the events team with us today who may be able to help. Um, although Zoom related issues, I'm afraid we may not be able to offer support. Um, and then finally, just to say that the webinar today does finish at eight, although there was um, on the Zoom invite, it did say just after half past seven. Um, so we aim to finish at eight o'clock this evening. Um, now to introduce the webinar. So yeah, once again, thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, it's great to be joined. We have people registering from across the UK and a couple of people slightly further afield as well. Um, this is our fourth webinar series from Hope Farm, um, but the first time that we've looked at water um, as a resource for biodiversity, for the farm business, for soils, um, and as a means to reduce pollution. Um, it's pretty timely that we've picked this year of all to talk about water, um, although it is incredibly plentiful at the moment. Um, the dr and the droughts of 2022 seem a long way off. Um, the way we manage water on farm is fundamental, um, both for benefits of what we are trying to do and well beyond our farm boundaries. Um, here at Hope Farm, we're trying to manage for business, for biodiversity and for soil health, carbon emissions and of course for water quality as well. Um, just this afternoon, we were discussing with our neighbours about managing flood risk. We've had difficulties getting the drilling done this autumn and winter, um, and the fields were sitting on pretty heavy clay soils, and um, they are quite wet, to say the least. The lack of water has meant that we've had to um, a few humps along the way of establishing trees in our agroforestry strips, um, and droughts meaning that crop establishment in the spring can always be difficult. And of course, all of these huge swings in whether we've got too much or too little water has its impact on biodiversity. That being said, water is a wonderful thing and can, is a web that connects absolutely everything that we're doing on farm. So when managed right and with a bit of help from um, how things are coming from above, they help us to grow our crops, they help biodiversity and everything. So the way that we manage it is so important. Um, this webinar aims to, alongside others, bring people together that we've learned from at Hope Farm um, to share ideas and knowledge on any given topic. And I'm really looking forward to discussing water from the perspective today of both research and advice and from the Natural England catchment sensitive farming um, and from practitioners with a um, practitioners who are facilitating a cross catchment cluster, if that's the correct terminology for it. Um, and we hope that from this webinar, you'll get an improved understanding of managing water on farm, um, more confidence at what can be done and some knowledge of opportunities available and where to go to find out a little bit more. Um, without further ado, I'm introducing our first speaker, who is Carl Sayer, um, a professor in the Department of Geography at the University College London, where he leads pond uh, the Pond Restoration Research Group. He's a freshwater ecologist of 30 years whose research expertise spans lakes, ponds, rivers and wet grassland restoration. He's passionate on the transfer of evidence-based science to aquatic conservation and restoration practice, and a regular advisor to the conservation sector and to government. He's a founder of the River Glaven Conservation Group and a founder and director of the Norfolk Ponds Project. Um, so we're really lucky to have him with us today as he is going to discuss pond restoration and management on farm. Um, before that discussion though, we have a couple of questions for you. 
and would like to introduce the first poll. So the first one is, how well do you understand the conservation value of ponds in farmland? And then the second, how well do you understand how to restore ponds on farm? Um, so I've heard from our RSPB events team that we have, our best has been a 90% response rate on polls. So I said that I think we can get 100%. I don't know if I'm being a bit bold there, Carl, but um, we'll, I yeah, think we, we'll we need see how that goes. There, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, not we sure just... I'm not sure I'd tick five on the, um, I think you're always learning. <laughs> It would be great if we had a five, wouldn't it? On the how well do you understand? And they, well, um, we'll, yeah, we'll see what people say. And hope and we'll ask this question at the end and it'll be really interesting to see, hopefully that people's understanding is, has improved. Um, where, where would you score yourself on here, Carl? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to say uh, five on the first one, and and you're always learning on the second one. So between four and five, if I didn't say that, it wouldn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't be right, would it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to learning quite a bit from yourself and um, other people speaking. So I think I, I'd give myself a three and a half on the first one. I'm probably on the on both actually. I think. Um, I think we've had about a minute. So if we bring those results up and see what people have scored themselves at, please. Okay, that's quite nice. So we've got pretty good base rating on understanding the conservation value of ponds on farmland. A lot of people at sort of a three, four, and a couple of fives. Um, and then how well do you understand how to restore farm ponds? We've got an appetite for more there, I think is the general is the general gist, Carl. Yeah. Um so I will now keep quiet and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Right, hopefully you've got that. Uh, yeah, thank you ever so much. I love doing talks about ponds. I never, ever, ever tire of it. So, um, so I'm going to talk about how you restore um, farm ponds and some top tips that really come from uh, the Norfolk Ponds Project, uh, where we've been practically delivering ponds uh, and UCL Pond Restoration Research Group, because we've been sort of studying these um, restorations that we've done. So we're kind of doing restoration, then studying it. So uh, the first thing I want to say is ponds are very important. Uh, they support uh, huge numbers of species, you know, a very large number of the priority species that we have in Britain live in ponds. But my key point really is that ponds are probably still the most neglected habitat in the British countryside. Uh, they really are um, important, but they don't get the, um, uh, you know, the credit that they need really. So my childhood was spent um, in ponds. I'm sure I was, a, you know, amphibious when I was little and I was wandering around the countryside um, fishing and catching newts and I knew all the ponds around my village and some of them looked like this, some of them didn't. Um, but if you have a pond like this on your farm, it is the biodiversity hotspot, a pond like you can see there and you have amazing species in it. Um, here's a picture of me when I was uh, 10 years old. And there's just a picture of my dad. Uh, and that's all in Norfolk, in uh, North Norfolk. Um, here's where I grew up. So here are all the ponds in Norfolk. And the first thing you really should strike home, really, is that there are a huge number. So between 22 and 23,000 ponds in the present day in Norfolk. What an amazing conservation opportunity. But the problem that we have is this, and I'm sure many of you know it, is that most of the ponds on farms in Norfolk and many other places in East Anglia as well look like this. So they're covered over with trees and scrub. Uh, there's very little light, they're full of dead wood. Uh, and as a consequence, they're very, very low uh, diversity. And that's through a lack of management over the last sort of um, half a century when they've stopped being used really, they become a bit more defunct. Um, other thing that we have, which is really common, 
all over East Anglia and Southern England and Northwest England, there's lots of ghost ponds. So these are ponds that have been lost uh, to infilling and they leave their sort of ethereal ghostly trace in the landscape. There's puddles, there's crop marks, uh, there's bits where the grass or the crop grows differently. So you can always see these spooky ghost ponds hiding out there in the landscape. So 10,000 lost in Norfolk alone. But we can restore them, and I'll give you more detail later on how you do that. By clearing away the scrub and by digging out the mud, uh, we can transform farmland ponds. And so we can do, like you see in the picture really, some before and after pictures now, a pond all scrubbed over there, some lovely um, hawthorn in flower there, but covered in scrub. You open out that scrub and uh, you get this incredible transformation of these plant rich, um, mega diverse ponds really quickly. Uh, here's another one in mid Norfolk and we've done hundreds and hundreds of these now. So I've got lots of these picture stories. Uh, and again, you remove the scrub, remove the mud and this incredible rejuvenation of the pond and this clear water and this extremely complex or sort of beautiful environment. And here we've got another one. Here's our pond team standing in the pond. We've just finished the restoration. Uh, and if the pond team could wander back in exactly the same place in two years, this is what they would have seen. That's what I saw. So it's absolutely astonishing what you can achieve by doing pond restoration. Uh, we can also deal with these ghost ponds. And you might think if you restore a ghost pond, it'll just end up being like a zombie. It won't be, uh, it won't be any good. You know, it's been buried for too long. But if you can find where the old ponds were and excavate them, just the same, exactly the same as the old restored ponds, you can resurrect ponds really successfully uh, and create these incredible species rich habitats in no time whatsoever. So it's incredibly quick. So we can resurrect ponds as well. How does this work in the old ponds and also remarkably in the ghost ponds, uh, it works because the sediment buried beneath the field or buried deep in an old pond has viable seeds and spores that last for many centuries. So once you uncover that mud that was laid down way back in the past, the plants that used to grow in that pond can then come back to life. And that's the key to the success. And it's a wonderful thing about wetlands that you can restore them in this way. And we've shown that in greenhouse experiments. You can see these are tanks in a greenhouse. Um, what are the results of pond restoration? I'll start off with the plants. You can see that's good. So the overgrown ponds are on the right-hand side of the, of the diagram there. Uh, and you can see that after, over time, uh, the number of species, both around the edge and in the middle of the pond, just keeps on climbing. So even after seven years, it keeps on going up. So it's incredibly uh, successful. We get really like, you know, getting so, so many more species coming back into these ponds. And the remarkable thing is that they're not just common things, you know, so we've got all sorts of plant structures, lots of common things, but also extremely rare things are coming back. In some cases, species that haven't been seen either in the county or in the country uh, for, you know, for, for centuries. So some of the things that you can see here are extremely rare. So it's an incredibly successful approach for plants. It's also fantastic for amphibians. If you've got great plant beds, amphibians, Love that. So here's some great crested newts in a pond landscape where we're restoring ponds. And as we restore ponds progressively, you can see the newts just spread through that landscape. Have I got newts for you? If we look at freshwater invertebrates in overgrown ponds versus restored ponds, you can see that restoring the ponds uh, doubles the number of invertebrate species present, over double in fact. It's a substantial number of species are also present in these ponds. So it's fantastic for plants, it's fantastic for invertebrates. It's fantastic also for the insects that live around ponds because by clearing the canopy, uh, we're also allowing wetland plants and uh, wildflowers to grow around the edges of the pond and in the margin because they're not shaded by the trees. And we found that also uh, massively increases the complexity of plant pollinator networks. So we get more species of flowering plant, more species of pollinating insect and the communities and the uh, networks are much more complex. 
Uh, we've also been able to see a doubling in the number of uh, species of farmland birds visiting restored ponds after restoration. So it, we're not only seeing huge increases in the number of birds, but we're seeing a huge increase in diversity. Why is that? Well, it's because of the insects. Um, all of those insects that are living in the pond, many of those uh, species are emerging at some stage as adults. And of course, that's fantastic bird food. So you can see in this diagram, we've got restored ponds on the left, overgrown unrestored ponds on the right, and a hugely increased number of emerging insects in the restored ponds. So that's a big, big fuel source for birds. We can see that in the next video. There's a mixed flock of swallows and swifts and Harris Martin's coming in and heavily feeding on this pond because it's releasing its insects. And just hot off the press, we've been working on bats and showing the same effects. Uh, because there's so many more insects released from restored ponds, they're hot spots for bat, bat activity in the landscape for things like soprano pipistrelle, common pipistrelle, uh, which are real classic sort of watery species. Uh, and so they're going to these ponds, uh, and especially the restored ponds, and they're feeding on insects. And the overgrown ponds provide much less of a food source and there's much less activity. So it's astonishing that the amount of species that benefit from ponds uh, across all parts of the food web, just from this tiny little bit of water that can be in the middle of the field. So it's spectacular diversity, really, from nothing. Uh, you can have these overgrown ponds that, that are fairly lifeless. And in a few years, you can have something like you can see in this picture. This is in the middle of an oilseed rape field. So it really is astonishing. But the key to success is doing it well. And we learn from a farmer. So everything that we know comes from this farmer on the right called Richard Waddingham. He taught us everything about pond restoration. All we're actually doing is just doing what he told us to do because he was looking after his... 40 ponds on his farm for 50 years, and they're spectacular ponds. So this is all for Richard, really. Which ponds should you restore? Um, the key thing really is, is to really concentrate on those, the really, really overgrown ponds in the, in the farm landscape. They're the ones that you get the biggest benefit from. But the key thing is not to restore all of them. Leave some of them overgrown because that's generally a good thing to do, to have different sorts of ponds in the landscape. If you have lots of ponds on your farm uh, that need restoration, do a few in each year in a staggered way. That's always the best way, because again, it gives you ponds at different uh, stages. Uh, the ponds not to select if possible. It's best to avoid, for biodiversity purposes at least, ponds that are connected to ditches or pipes that strongly drain arable fields. Sometimes you can get away with it, but, if you've got a really strong connection to the field and you're picking up fertilizers and sprays, it's generally not good for ponds. Um, avoid a road runoff if you can. Um, ideally, your pond will have a buffer strip after restoration. It's generally a good idea to avoid ponds that have big sort of mature or veteran trees around them because the tree is just such an important thing. It's better to choose a pond that's you know, much more scrub dominated than dominated by say a big oak. Uh, avoid ponds that will be used for wildfowl uh, shooting or common carp stocking or uh, that might be used by dogs. They really, they really just, you really want to choose ponds that you can really focus on biodiversity on. The timing of pond restoration is best done from about September to November. Uh, the key thing really is working when it's dry. And as everyone knows from this year, you know, it's really hard to do pond restoration at the moment. There's so much water around. Using a machine is, is virtually impossible. So you're waiting until everything stops breeding, uh, but not waiting too long. So try and get it done before Christmas and ideally by the end of November. Um, this is a really formulaic thing, but if you can remove the scrub, especially on the south and west sides, that doesn't always work. Sometimes you've got a hedge that you, you don't want to remove, obviously, so you'll change what you do. But the key thing is, you know, get rid of the scrub and the trees from at least 50 percent of the margin or more. And the major thing is you need to open up that pond to the light, majorly open it up. Is is the whole point of this is really making a big, big, big impact. Go for it, basically. 
This is the sort of thing, really. So we've got some scrub on the right that's fantastic for birds to nest in, but we've got a brilliant open south side to this pond here. Uh, and that's going to really colonise well with plants and, and going to be fantastic for wildlife. Um, pulling out trees from the pond. So if you've got some willows or alders that are rooted in the middle of the pond, especially willow, it's a good idea to pull those trees out from the middle of the pond because they'll just grow back and cover your pond so quickly. But on the hard banks of the edge of the pond, uh, it's important not to do that because you damage the banks. So here you can see arrowed, a tree higher up there. You see one tree has been left. You can see some other trees have been coppiced there on the edge of the banks. No need to touch that with a digger. You're just removing the soft sediment and uh, just removing trees in the pond. Anything there on the edge, coppice down as low as you can. If you start pulling them out, you'll destroy the banks. And the banks of the ponds, uh, of old ponds, are, you know, often got really interesting plants there. And it's, it's part of history. Uh, dig out the mud. Again, same with the trees, aim to have a big impact. You know, get a large amount of mud out, but don't dig out the clay. Don't touch the hard bank material. You're just after the soft stuff there. And a key thing is don't aim to change the size or shape or slope to the pond. Just follow the pond as it was, restore it as it was, celebrate its history. So don't create shallows if they're not there and uh, don't, don't change uh, shape, size, slopes, but go for it dig out at least two thirds of the area or more as possible. This is your chance to do it. And, uh, and you know, take your chance while it's there. Um, if you've finished and you've got little bits of clay showing in places like you can see in this pond here, that's a good thing, you know, that shows you've got loads of mud out, but the key thing is don't remove the clay and also make sure you leave some mud in the bottom, especially mud like this, which is, um, you can see full of snails, and if it's full of aquatic snails, it will be full of seeds. So make sure you leave loads of that in the bottom because that's your seed bank and that's the key to success. That's the sort of gold which makes it work. Uh, once you finish, spread the soil thinly over the stubble. Ideally, your stubble field's perfect or somewhere else you can put it, but it's fantastic for the soil if you can do this a bit of time. Uh, it's brilliant organic matter. Uh, and don't spread it around the margin of the pond or obviously in other important areas. Um, I'm not going to go into ghost ponds because I haven't got time, but it's lots of the same principles apply really. You're trying to um, find the old seed bank, which you can see here at the bottom of, uh, of the trench here, and excavating down to that and then trying to follow the pond. And the uh, key thing is, again, in this case, you can actually sculpt the edges and have shallow edges, but you're leaving this seed bank, this black stuff there in the bottom of the pond. That's the key to success. And uh, just to show you how astonishing this, this is a ghost pond seven years on. So this is a pond that was totally buried under a field seven years after it's been resurrected. You can see that there's no way you could see there was never a pond there, uh, you know, buried underneath the field. Um, other key thing for all of these ponds, whether you're creating, resurrecting, or especially restoring is, is frequent management. Scrub will start to grow and come back, especially from the coppice stuff. So in small ponds, every three to four years, you're probably clearing and coppicing back that regrowth in a bigger pond, you can last for longer, but you do need to keep on top of that. It's the smallest job, uh, but if you do that, then you keep your ponds in good condition. So finally, it's the ponds rally call, really. We must not neglect ponds in conservation projects and agri-environment schemes. Restoring ponds may be, or I think it is, the most successful form of ecological restoration that we know of. We don't, we can't just do this to all these habitats. It seems to work spectacularly well for ponds doing restoration. It's a brilliant way of balancing intensive farming with nature conservation. And it's also, it should be central to nature recovery, but it's also really positively a quick way of getting really brilliant uh, landscape scale benefits. It's a quick way of getting, getting stuff back on the farm. So just to advertise, we've got a new pond guide out, um, which should be really helpful to anyone wanting to restore, create or manage ponds. It's freely available at the uh, Norfolk Ponds website and also the Freshwater Habitats Trust website. We co-authored this, um, this guide, so hopefully that will be really helpful. Uh, dedicating all my talks forever to Richard Waddingham, who taught us everything that we knew. Um, sadly died a few years ago, but the most wonderful man, and he taught us how to restore ponds. So thank you very much.
thank you very much for that, Carl. Um, I'm just waiting for my video. It might pop up in a minute. Um, first off, I, I hope you had your dad's permission to share that picture of him. <laughs> yes, no, I took that. Yeah, it was just I just took it one summer's day and he, when he wasn't looking. But yeah, he was he's he's always fine with it. That's all right then. That's fine. It's never a problem. Yeah. Um. No, it was it was great though to see about see that increase in diversity of like across the board after restoration. What the impact is. Um. And the issue of drainage ponds. I know at Hope Farm once we had that in our head and started looking, it's amazing how many ponds are impacted by drainage on the farm we've got only a couple where they are not impacted by drainage at all so i guess we've got to really look at those and be really careful with what we're doing on them um and with the timing as well if starting in september that gives a nice length of time for us to think about what we're doing and start preparing for next year um yeah it's post-harvest really and uh, it varies on your farm some some pond networks have lots of links to the to the drainage system some some don't and of course you can always unlink ponds in some cases so it's taking your chances really no brill no thanks a lot and um if anyone has any other questions feel free to send them in and we'll we'll quiz carl on them later um so the next talk that we've got is from philippa mansfield thanks for joining us today philippa um from catchment sensitive farming um Philippa yeah, works for Natural England as an agricultural lead for the um, catchment sensitive farming um, partnership, which provides advice to farmers to improve water and air quality and reduce flood risk. Um, so we're kind of stepping well beyond the farm boundaries now on the impacts that we can have. Um, and um, Philippa is also the project manager for ammonia reduction from trees evidence projects. Um, and previously has worked as an agronomist, a researcher, an agricultural consultant in the UK and in West Africa, um, after graduating in agricultural science from Leeds University and a PhD on air pollution um, effects on barley diseases from Imperial College. And so, yes, Philippa is going to share the work that catchment sensitive farming are doing um, to address water quality, reduce pollution um, and I believe, discuss what opportunities are available. So I'll hand over to you now, Philippa. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much, Georgina. Can you see my slides okay? Um, yes, I can. I think if you go into, um, we can see the um, non-presenter mode. So I don't know if you need to switch oh, yeah, screens yeah. over or yeah. go into presenter view. Okay. Hang on. <laughs> um. Um, I think... Yeah, maybe if you click resume slideshow or there's the top little one that looks like a little um, projector in the top corner mm. on the red bar at the top. I'm get to this. Or even click present in Teams might work. Oh, there you go, from beginning, that should work. Okay. No. No. <laughs> it's this. At the moment. Um. Maybe click resume slideshow. Oh, if it's not working, we can still see it really well from there. Or um, we could get someone that. resume slideshow. Yeah, is that working? You can share. working now um no, I'll, I'll tell you what should we get um Haley can share it and then we just give the nod when you want um Haley to click through okay then thank you everyone bear with us a minute sorry about this that's all right <laughs> a minute ago. there we go I did something wrong okay thanks thanks very much really inspired by Carl there talking about his um his ponds and uh yeah seeing what amazing results you can get in just a few years restoring those those ponds up, up in Norfolk and yeah we can see we can do that elsewhere as well um of course there's, there's um yeah various grants you can get through 
um, country side stewardship on that and advice from Natural England as well, who I work for. So, yeah, I know Carl works with our water advisors on those. Um, so I'm going to kind of um, move us on now to talk about um, catchment sensitive farming and how we work with farmers um, to improve water quality. Um, so just to introduce um, catchment sensitive farming, CSF as we call it, been going for about over 16 years now. There's a partnership between DEFRA, um, Natural England, the Environment Agency, and um, Forestry Commissioners re have recently joined uh, the partnership as well. Um, so we can do a bit more with trees as well. And we now cover the whole of England. We used to be a bit more targeted in particular areas, but now we work across England with farmers. Um, and we have a network of catchment sensitive farming advisors who are trusted local advisors. Um, and they can provide specialist farm visits um, and also support the farmers um, with grants um, um, and um, and really they're providing advice um, about how to um, improve farm infrastructure and change farm practices, um, land management and land use with the aim of improving air and water quality um, and to reduce flood risk. A lot of the advice that we give also benefits for brings benefits for climate change and water resources, but also for for farm businesses as well. So often we're looking at efficiency savings on farm, um, and supporting farmers through agricultural transition, helping them make use of the sport that is available. Next slide, please. So if you just click on the on the slide, we just see an, a very visual sign of pollution, water pollution, which, um, which is coming off of far farmland. Um, if you click again, I think you should see some movement that, oh, sorry, it didn't quite work, but um, yeah, you can you often see um, soil coming out of gateways and it's being washed out because um, really the the rain is is not going into into the into the soil in the field, but it's washing down the surface, and then it can wash down a road and run into a river like this, or maybe wash down the field and go into one of those clean ponds that Carl's trying to restore there, um, and there it can cause problems because it can smother fish spawning grounds um, and, and can harm fish and macrophytes, and the soil can carry things like phosphate with it, nutrients attached to the soil particles, and that can cause increased algal growth in fresh waters, which can be toxic, but also just causes eutrophication. Um, and this particular problem, freshwater triple SIs, where we get overgrowth of certain species and then other species are smothered out. Um, unfortunately, most water bodies in England are now not achieving good ecological status, which is what they're judged under under the framework, water framework directive. And often this is linked to poor soil and nutrient management. And a lot of it is coming from farmland, um, about 70%, um, because most of the land is is farmed. Um, but it's also um, a problem for farmers because it's this is a loss of, of valuable assets, all that soil being run off estimated about 2.9 million tonnes of topsoil is, is lost through water and wind erosion um, a year and that's worth between 0.9 and 1.4 billion pounds a year it's estimated. Next slide please. So and the sort of problems that can be caused as we saw sort of um, polluted water flowing out of, of gateways can then go, go down and can block channels and cause localized, localized flooding downstream can get into rivers and degrade the river habitat. Um, also, um, it's not always visible. So sometimes um, we're, we're losing nutrients such as nitrate through leaching through the soil profile um, and also through field drains. And then it's then getting in stitches and, and into watercourses that way. And if you've got a sensitive site, like somewhere where you're extracting drinking water downstream, then that causes um, extra cost for the water company who have to then treat or, or won't be able to extract that site um, to achieve the drinking water quality. Or if you've got bathing waters or shellfish waters downstream, that can also, um, the water quality impacts those due to the bacteria or the excess nutrients. Um, nitrates, for example, can cause eutrophication in Coastal waters. Next slide, please. 
So the approach that we take in CSF to dealing with pollution problems um, is really the, the kind of three three steps. So we look at the whole catchment for a start. So it, we're, what we're looking at really is, is diffuse pollution. So small amounts of pollution coming from all over a catchment and it's kind of cumulative effect. So um, you know, we, we sometimes do get pollution incidents, which the EA tends to deal with, but we're looking at kind of small levels of pollution, but which they add up to have an effect on, on water quality and, and affecting a receptor such as a river. So our approach is, first of all, reduce the source of the pollution. That's the first 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 starting point, really. Um, and that might be in a field, it might be in a farmyard, um, it might be where, where animals are, or a manure heap or slurry store. Um, and then next step is to break or slow the pathway of pollution. I mean, ideally, if you can remove the source, that's ideal. But if you can't um, look at the pathways, it might be down tram lines, down tracks, or directly into the river, for example. And then the fine and finally, um, protect the receptor. So um, if all else fails, um, or as a, as a kind of belt and braces approach, um, if you can protect the river, uh, the receptor, then you know with buffers, buffered areas, or um, um, stopping uh, animals getting into the water, then then that's that's. Um, that that is protecting that water quality. Um, with air quality, for example, it's not very visible. It can be up in the the receptor could be a moorland um, up up on the hill um, close to a farm, or it could be uh, further away a town where the where the um, air quality chemicals react and and uh, with the traffic chemicals and and cause poor air, air quality there. So it's a bit more invisible. Next slide, please. Okay, so we, in CSF, we um, have an evidence team in Environment Agency who look at what effect um, the actions that have been taken through our advice have um, on, on water quality. And essentially what it is, is, is the measures that we advise uh, multiplied by the number of people who take them up. So a big factor is um, how widespread the take up of the different measures is. So how many farmers are actually putting into action um what we recommend um and we we find about a two-thirds of the actions we recommend are actually implemented by farmers so and it's all totally voluntary sometimes they have grants to help them um but it's a, it's a good response basically to our advice um and we and we find that the longer we've been in a catch and the the better the reduction in pollution so here on the graph you're seeing um a greater reduction in suspended solids which is the those sediments getting into the water and broadly the advice that we gave is around soil nutrient pesticide and livestock management or it might be farm infrastructure changes um and the three top mo um top most effective measures that, that we found through csf um have been um autumn cover crops which have been uh, good at reducing nutrients and sediment fencing off of water courses the, which is best for reducing the fecal, ind org fecal indicator organisms, so bacteria that affect bathing water quality um, from livestock, that is. Um, and the third one, reducing stocking rates when fields are wet uh, and you can get damaged soils and then you get sediment runoff. So that's because there's widespread uptake of those measures. There are a few things which could be more effective but they're quite hard to do, like land use change, constructive wetlands, things like that. Um, so it could be very effective, but um, not widespread. Next slide, please. Okay, so the types of advice that we um, we provide, just kind of give a few examples, really. So starting with soil health, really crucial, um, is avoiding damaging soils. Um, the reason why the, the water's running off is because it can't get into very badly compacted soils, as you can see there. Um, it should be an over-trafficked -tra um, in, in poor condition. Um, so we'll assess soils with farmers and we'll look at how we can improve the structure to improve rain infiltration and holding capacity, which will help with flooding and um, in drought situations and reduce runoff and erosion. I also look at field drainage and whether that's suitable. Um, waterlogged soils will give off more um, 
nitrous oxides so um that's a, a um, greenhouse gases um so we want to avoid avoid that uh, but at the same time we don't want to fast track the pollutants to the river um but also a lot of this this will help um the crops um and crop productivity a lot of these measures improving your soil will help the crops grow better as well next slide please so just thinking about the pollution pathways and how you can slow the flow of pollution or divert or break the pathway of pollution and capture any sediment for example before it gets into um, a river or a pond or a lake whatever um, or a, a sensitive site so thinking about tracks on the left there often they can become a source of pollution if they're you know there's a lot of sediment that's being produced by them and if they're sloping and they're connected to often they are connected to roads or rivers and then we'll, we'll um, the pollution will get in so sometimes resurfacing of tracks uh, but it's important to remember uh, cross drains or um, sleeping policemen to divert that flow um, in the middle there we've got an example of some swales with check dams stone check dams in this case which basically helping slow that flow down a grass field there um, and allowing the sediment to settle out and the water to soak in before it gets down to the river. Um, you can use things like um, field margins or field strips to to um, slow the flow as well, or hedgerows, um, agroforestry even. Um, and if they're strategically placed along a contour um, and, and the cultivations across a contour, then that will reduce the flow. Um, and also planting trees next to the river to, to protect the river as well. Next slide, please. So just a few examples of improving um, crop um, health, but also soil health and reducing nitrate leaching. So autumn sown cover crops. Uh, we've done some trials and found that compared with over winter stubble, um, the amount of nitrate loss during the winter, if we had a cover crop, is, is much reduced. Um, but also, and because you've got that cover on the soil, it's protecting the soil surface and you're re reducing the amount of, of erosion and runoff as well. Plus, um, if you're um, cultivating uh, or uh, getting that, um, breaking down the cover, the cover crop and allowing it to go back into the soil, um crimping it or whatever then you're you, in the long term building up the soil organic matter that will help with that water infiltration and storage so good for water quality good for flood risk and there's some grants available uh, we've had it in countryside stewardship and we've now got it in sustainable farming incentive sfi a multi-species cover crop next slide please Another one that's um, also in CS and SFI is herbal lays. A lot of interest in this at the moment. Um, and this is really looking at a mixture of different grasses, different legumes, herbs, flowering species um, that you can plant um, instead of a basic um, perennial ryegrass um, lay, really. Um, and the idea is the more diverse you've got, the more varied root structures you, you've got below ground and also more varied above. And if you've got legumes in there, you're fixing nitrogen, so you're building fertility and you can avoid using nitrogen fertilizer. So reduce those greenhouse gases from that. Also, you can get benefits from pollinators and biodiversity and potentially for cattle health. Um, where you don't want to uh, do this or avoid doing it is where where, the, where you might be causing some damage to historic features or triple SIs or PT soils or um, uh, you don't also want to plough up long term grassland uh, which is really good carbon store but in their place these can be really useful next slide please and this is just a farm up in Norfolk went to visit back in July 2022 in that drought year very hot um, first of all we went to see one dairy farm um, still using normal grass lays. Cows were all inside because they'd run out of grass. There was no grass to graze, no silage to cut either. Um, then we went to this this region ag farm and, and the cows were still out there. He was mob grazing them rotationally um, on the herbal lays, which was still green. Um, so it just showed how useful it is to have different varieties that will stay green in the drought years. And it also had these cover crops in there, which were um, building up fertility and soil health. Next slide, please. 
Um, yeah, we give also give advice on nutrient management and use of buffers to protect watercourses. Um, and there's again, there's help available through SFI for these as well, um, and also for in, including legumes in improved grassland and or legume fallow, which can be a great kind of black grass break, but also can help build up those that soil health as well and improve the soil structure. Um, so all good for water quality, climate change, biodiversity, and help comply with regs as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, a lot of our attention is 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 actually spent in the in the farmyard. There are a lot of grants available that are very popular um, for helping with this uh, through countryside stewardship, um, and actually there can be big sources of pollution. So um, you know, just messy yards that where we can have sediment, but particularly if there's animals in the yard, um, and that can get mobilised and and get lost. So concrete yard renewal. Um, and um, roofing over yards where animals collecting, uh, but also over slurry, slurry stores and manure stores um, can all help reducing the amount of water that's getting onto those dirty yards and then forming that source of pollution. The key thing is then keeping the clean water that comes off clean roofs separate from the dirty water or contaminated water, uh, which we want to contain and, and treat properly. Um, and it might just be a simple thing like fixing a gutter, um, but we can also make use sometimes, you know, if you've, you're sorting out your, your gutters, you can um, harvest your rainwater as well and make use of that. And pesticide spraying handling areas are also, also a key place where you want to contain um, any of the runoff there and then spray that spray that um, sprayer, sprayer uh, runoff in, onto, into a, a bio bed so that it can get treated um and use safely next slide please um okay and and then more infrastructure across the farm um things that you can do such as putting hard bases under livestock truck uh troughs where you tend to get a lot of poaching but also just thinking about um whether the weather condition is right for animals to be out um how many animals are out where are they and, and particularly avoiding this sort of situation you can see in the middle there where there's very there's bare soil exposed over winter um and that could be running way down the slope and straight into the stream um and, and then fencing off watercourses where that's appropriate as well and that can avoid kind of damaging the the beds as well um at the the sides of the rivers and and then depositing their manure it's directly into the water and causing problems that way next slide please so just an example of one of the farmers we work with up in Yorkshire with Yorkshire Water and the Environment Agency. So this was a bit of land that was um, sloping down to the River Whisk and he, um, the water company were having problems with soil sediment in the river, brown, brown water. Um, and um, so we work with them and to, first of all, fix the soil structure with cultivations, did an assessment of where the problems were. Um, and then try to build the, the soil organic matter by putting sludge on for a few years. What we found was after a few years, the phosphate levels were too high. So we then switched to green green compost. Um, and then um, uh, we moved he, at the same time, the farmer moved from plowing um, to, to min till to direct drilling. So reducing the amount of traffic and heavy machinery that was going on to so reducing the kind of damage to the soil that, that he was doing and, and chopping up the, the soil biology, which is so vital for keeping that soil in good health. Next slide, please. So just a kind of summary of um, what CSF achieved um, in the first a few phases of the project. Um, so we've had 80,000 actions taken by farmers voluntarily. This was up until 2018, so a while ago now. Um, we're in the middle of the next phase now. Um, we've achieved kind of a reduction of um, pesticides in the rivers where we've been working with farmers of 34% and up to 12% of nitrate, phosphate and sediments. So all um, all worthwhile stuff and, and things that um, you know farmers have done really to improve the water environment. Next slide, please. 
yeah and I think we're going to have a question se session at the end but if you want to find out more about um CSF do go on the link later and and look up your local CSFA thank you brilliant thanks very much for that Philippa um it was yeah it's so good to see how many opportunities there are for farmers to do things and to get funding and advisory support as well um and the things just like even putting cover crops in what a difference that can make um it'd be interesting later maybe in the q a shoehorn a question about what sort of cover crops um make a difference and that kind of thing um anyway we'll discuss that later i'll move on swiftly to our last speakers um so we have emma and joe joining us um hi both um hi. emma and joe our husband and wife um, team who farm 600 hectares um, near Braintree in Essex and in November 2022 they established the North Essex Farm Cluster which is situated um, in the River Pant and Blackwater catchment. Um, the water is a focus for the farm cluster and the group which are currently delivering a pilot project focused on a 10 kilometre stretch of the River Pant. Um, so really look forward to hearing about that, your experiences and um, yeah and aim, aims going forward as well. Thanks, Georgie. Right, I'm just going to hope this works for us. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can see that there. So yeah, my name's Emma Gray, and this is my husband, Joe. And as Georgie said, we farm uh, up here just to the north of Braintree in Essex. Um, we do uh, a sort of regenerative approach to farming here and a long history of being in various kind of conservation schemes. Uh, and as Georgie mentioned, uh, towards the end of 2022, we got involved in setting up a farm cluster in this area. Um, so here we all are with our farm cluster members. So we are an independent farmer led cluster. Um, some clusters are kind of hosted within NGOs or other wildlife and conservation based groups, but Ours is um, a group of farmers and led by Joe and I as farmers ourselves within the cluster area. Um, we're looking at working together to deliver greater benefits for water, soil and wildlife across the catchment. And our cluster area, as Georgie said, covers the Blackwater River catchment. The River Blackwater is actually starts as the River Pant out at Saffron Walden in Essex and changes at Brangy to become the Blackwater and flows out through the estuary at Malden. Um, we provide uh, advice, funding, project management, events, and other opportunities for farmers within our patch. Um, we're going to talk to you now a little bit about our Pant Valley pilot project. If I just skip on to the next slide, hopefully we're going to see a little bit of a YouTube film that you should be able to see and I'll, and I'll talk us through. But the beauty of the farm cluster is that we can work at a landscape scale and our role as the cluster coordinators is to have a real bird's eye view of what can be achieved across the landscape. And hopefully this next um, short bit of the presentation will give you an idea of, of how we're going about that. So it might take a second to get going here. Okay, brilliant. So this is a flyover using a drone of uh, the sort of blueprint for our Punt Valley pilot project. And the Punt, as I mentioned, is the name of the Upper Blackwater, where it comes from its source to the southeast of Saffron Walden to Braintree. Most of the work on Farm One is out of shot here, but they have restored 11 ponds, created one new pond in an arable field, um, and an existing line of oak trees um, in another arable field is going to be enhanced with new planting of oak, hazel and hawthorn to create an agroforestry area in the centre of the field, underplanted with some wildflowers. So we're moving along the river here. OK, this second farm is installing a silver pastoral system with 700 metres of new hedgerow planting and grazing for rare breed native cattle. The trees will provide shade for the stock, increase carbon sequestration potential and improve the habitat for a variety of species. The woodland in the background that you can see there is going to have a natural flood management scheme uh, created with an attenuation pond and a series of leaky dams to slow the flow of water through a deep ditch that cuts down to the river. Okay, so just following the line of the river here across the landscape. 
and you can get a real sense of that with the drone. The river is in flood at this point. This is in the early autumn, but it's looking much the same now. Um, and you can see here how the existing floodplain is working really well, keeping the water off the arable field. Um, so we've got four ponds that are just slightly out of shot there on the northern side of the valley that are being created as part of the project. And then we come along here, arriving at our fourth farm where we're creating a new attenuation pond, which is slowing down a tributary of the pan and holding water in the landscape there. So just coming through. So on the next farm here, we've got three new ponds being created in grassland. And then all the existing fence lines are being planted out with new native hedgerows. We've got a new native hedgerow being planted here around the wood on two sides and then down to the river. So that's creating a nice scrub woodland edge and connecting the woodland habitat to the river. On the same farm, we've identified that the river had been straightened into a channel at some point to feed the nearby mill. So at this site, we're restoring a, an historic attenuation pond and also reconnecting the former natural river channel to the existing river. So you can see that there. Um, so we're flying over a bit here, which has got lots of historic flood meadows and wet woodland containing various springs and ponds that have been well maintained over the years. But in order to extend and enhance that habitat, the farm here is creating a new scrape connected to the existing wet woodland. The neighbouring farm here are restoring some hedgerow and then the next farm along the river, which is just out of shot as we swing by. The next um, is restoring an existing grassland, an existing grassland pond. And then across the river on the south side of the valley, a farm has created five new ponds, four of which are on grassland and one is in woodland. And they're also planting 350 metres of new hedgerow. Swinging back over the river to the northern bank, the farm here has created a silvio pastoral meadow with 700 and, sorry, 970 metres of new trees and hedgerow planting, which comprises almost 5,000 new plants going in. And they've got a dairy sheep herd on this farm, which is grazing the pasture. On the neighbouring farm, a new hedgerow is being put in to connect the silvio pastoral scheme to an existing spinney. And then the final stop as we fly up to the top of this part of our project is the natural flood management intervention across four farms at the western edge of the project. And we've got a slide in a moment or two's time that's going to give us a bit more detail about that natural flood management element. Skip on to my next slide. Okay, so that's just a little summary there of what we've got going on. So we've got 34 kind of ponds being created. I won't read it um, out for you because you can see it all on your screen. And then we've just got a little sketch on the side there. This project was built by literally getting the farms involved. There's 12 farms in all involved in this project. And it was developed by us sitting down in the pub with a group of farmers and just really chatting through what water features they had on their farm and what they'd like to see created as part of the project. We used that as the starting point to design the project. And then uh, we sort of took us and, and used the strength of working as a, as a cluster. We took our plan, it was this exact sketch actually to begin with, and we went out to anyone that we thought might be interested in funding the project and said that this is what we can do as a group of 12 farmers in the first stage. Um, how can you support us? What funding is available? And how can we make the application process for that funding as streamlined as possible? So really just trying to use our strength in numbers as a cluster to um, to make that process of getting the funding in to do the work as smooth as, smooth as possible for the farmers involved. Um, I'm going to let Joe do a bit of talking now, I think, because he's going to talk to us uh, about one of the ponds that we created as part of the project. Do you want me to press play? Yes, this is a short video um, showing the process of restoring a ghost pond in an arable field, which is part of that project we just looked at. Um, the pond was evident as a low wet area in cereal crops with wheat plants dying out in that part of the field most winters and black grass spreading out from that spot across the rest of the field. So you can see that the pond is in close proximity to other ponds that are being restored or created as part of this project. Um, 
and just across the valley there um, is the River Pant, just quite a short distance away. Using 19th century OS maps, we were able to confirm that there had once been a pond there. And so we made the decision, decision to restore it using uh, the approach that Carl had taught us about. Um, we'll be using stewardship options to create a buffer around the pond and to leave the field as a sensible shape for the arable farming operations. Funding for the pond work was obtained through FWAG East, who managed the district level licensing funding in our area to conserve great crested newts. So this is um, the natural flood management project at Weathersfield, which was the sort of last, the end of the sort of flyover of the project. Uh, this was sort of in the distance. It's the newest part of the project. So fortunately, um, we haven't got a nice video of this one yet. I will endeavor to explain the video. So basically at the top left of the image, uh, the main image uh, in the middle, there's a culvert which goes under the road uh, from, and the blue line all the way through is, is a large ditch uh, and it's tributary. Um, the ditch is pretty enormous and at high levels of rain, it flows very fast and it's come very close to flooding the property at the top and flooding the road. So we've been looking at a sort of natural flood management project, which is just going to utilise um, six leaky dams and two attenuation ponds. Um, the leaky dams are going to be sort of engineered so that they raise the height of the water in the ditch. Um, we've got some areas of this land is actually land drained into the ditch, but it's such a deep ditch that there's quite a lot of capacity still to store water below the level of the outlets of the land drains um so but that's sort of being worked into the project so it doesn't doesn't affect the drains the drainage scheme for the land um and so as you follow the ditch along towards the middle of the, the um the page there's um what was a historic sort of large pond we found on the, uh, I think this is the 1880 map on the far left of the screen. So you can see how large that pond is on there. And today that is um, literally uh, a very overgrown um, ditch. There's no pond there at all. It's completely silted up. Just the ditch just passes through that area. So uh, as part of the project, we're going to um, redig the ditch to its original size and control the outlet from the pond so that um the pond retains sort of about 600 mil of water in the bottom of it all the time um but then the height under high levels of rainfall and high flow can um it could store sort of three times that depth um so it really take the shock and the impact out of the downstream culvert um and the flooding is only there for like a day or two days maximum so it's just really just trying to slow that water down for those two days and um yeah, that's the basically that project. Um, so what the Flan Cluster tries to do is pull together a blend of different funding to make these projects happen. Um, so we make use of stewardship where we can, but we're also using other um, public sector funding and private sector funding. So the Pant Valley project that we've just been talking about, um, all these people have sort of been involved um, funding either with sort of hard cash coming into the project or with expertise and support in in other ways so it's a real partnership project that we've been able to pull together most of the funding comes directly into the farm cluster which is a community the farm cluster is set up as a community interest company so we've uh, we're able to hold funding and then use that to um we apply for funding hold it in a central pot and then use it to fund these projects as we go um Outside of the, the Pant Valley project, the kind of water connected work that we've been doing in the catchment, we work with catchment sensitive farming and also uh, the Blackwater is a, a river that's used for drinking water abstraction, which opens up lots of opportunities to work with uh, water companies um, on keeping the, the river as clean as we can. Um, so there's a couple of examples here of projects that have happened within the farm cluster. So this uh, on the right here is basically a fiberglass bund uh, 
a bit like a swimming pool that is now holding liquid fertilizer tanks. This particular farm sits directly above the river and quite a deep slope from the farmyard down. So really important to have good protection there in the event of a spill. Um, we also try and link to wider uh, wildlife initiatives and often water is a good theme um, to start that conversation. So Operation Turtle Dove happens in our catchment. We've got lots of farms engaging with that and as well as well as the kind of scrubby habitat that uh, turtle doves need and the clear ground to feed on, water is really important. So making sure that we've got good, clean water source for the birds to use when they're in uh, on farm is really important. Um, we've also been working with the Essex Wildlife Trust. So they did some environmental DNA surveys um, of the river um, and we invited them to an event. Uh, we, we host a series of pub nights for the farm cluster through the winter months, once a month, and just try and get an interesting speaker to come and speak to cluster members. Um, and so we had the results of this survey presented. So found lots and lots of different species using the river. Um, nothing sort of really leaping out of us, but part of this was, um, you'll notice we've got a picture of a beaver at the bottom because a farm within our farm cluster has got a beaver enclosure on a tributary of the river pant. Um, so they did pick up the beaver DNA when they were surveying. Um, but the point of the survey really was to prepare our river catchment for um, a mink eradication project. So in East Anglia, there's a project led by Water Life Recovery East, um, and that is a highly successful um, mink eradication program. Um, they've eradicated mink from large areas of Norfolk and Suffolk using this smart trap system. And we're hopeful that the funding is going to come to our river catchment uh, either this year or next uh, to allow our farmers to participate in the project. So it was really good to get those survey results. We can see that we don't have a healthy population of waterfalls. There are pockets where they are on the pant, but they're few and far between. But we do have mink and a mink DNA found at almost every sampling point. So uh, it makes us a really ideal river to get involved in that project. Um, other bits and bobs that we do as a farm cluster, we hold events and workshops. Often they're kind of water themed. Um, Carl, who's been speaking with us this evening, came and did a really fantastic pond uh, creation and restoration workshop with us on farm. So Carl came, spoke to us, and then we went out and had a look at some of ponds that we're restoring on our own farm and had the digger going and just looking kind of the real practical do's and don'ts of pond restoration under um, Carl's guidance. Um, we also try and, as a farm cluster, kind of renegotiate some of the relationships with agencies that operate on the water courses where we farm um, so people like the environment agency and the water companies that perhaps haven't always had a, a smooth and easy relationship with farmers in the catchment we're very much about trying to kind of wipe that slate clean um, and develop a positive working relationship with them and that's worked really well um, for example with this most recent pan project the environment agents have been incredibly supportive and generous with their advice and funding and just sort of sharing their resources with us to make some of that project happen and again the water companies have been very generous in supporting any projects that we're doing on water courses because ultimately they are a beneficiary of the cleaner water that we're able to provide um yes yeah, so we've got a couple of other shots there of us at our pub nights um us down in the corner there with, with john palsy from a neighboring farm cluster giving a talk at a sustainable um ea sustain festival recently um yes yeah, so we just try and offer a really wide a variety of things for farmers to get involved in and not forgetting the social side as well because that's really important particularly in the sort of darker winter months when things are a bit quieter on farm and i think yeah i think that's it so uh, anyone that wants to find out a little bit more do feel free to get in touch um that's our website at the bottom there and there's a link there that you can get in touch and email if you have any queries or questions or would like to find anything else out about our project but thank you Thank you so much for that, guys. Um, it's really good to see how things are things are working practically in an app, in a real setting. From um, what Carl was talking about, although we saw some great pictures of practical stuff Carl was doing as well, but how it's working across the whole landscape um, and sort of drawing in bits from the funding that Philip has talked about already, but um, also how yeah everyone working together, you've actually got access to lots of different extra opportunities. Um, and I do love a drone video as well. 
<laughs> so thanks very much for that. Um, so for the audience, that is the end of our talks and we're now going into the Q&A session. Um, I hope that that has given um, you all quite a good idea of yeah some of the research behind things, the practical and the funding opportunities available and the advice available as well um, to improve management of water on farms. Before we jump into the Q&A, we are going to rerun that poll to hopefully see that people's understandings have improved. Um, this is where we hope that we've delivered what we set out to do at the beginning. Um, so we've got the same questions on the first one being, how well do you understand the conservation value of ponds on farmland? And the second question being, how well do you understand how to restore farm ponds? Um, I certainly, I, I feel like I've got a bit more confident on on those two. You might, might get to a four, perhaps. Um, I can't wait to see that how that ghost pond that you've done turned out. That looks amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. Well, so they're impressed by that. <laughs> uh, it really does. Yeah, it's, it's a good sized pond as well. Um, yeah. yeah so, oh, we've got the answers through already. Um, so, yeah, that, I'd, I'd say that's that's a pretty good success, really. All fours and fives are understanding the conservation value. Um, and then understanding how to restore funds we've got four out of five so um brilliant that that's really good to see and we can move on oh oh good i've also got conf confirmation we've got a hundred percent answer rate in record time so we've got an rs a whole rspb record <laughs> for the events team from the audience tonight um that's good to see um i'll move on to the questions now um one has come from um, David White here, which I think, um, Carl, you typed a bit of an answer to about bat boxes around ponds, but it would be good to hear your thoughts on that if, as well, if that's okay. Yeah, I think, well, I don't, um, the, the question is, should you plant a bat box next to a pond? Um, you could do, obviously, but one thing I'd sort of suggest really is that, um, that what we've found is that the bats will actually they know where the ponds are and they'll fly they'll fly to get to them uh, even in the middle of a field so you don't necessarily have to pl put the bat boxes next to uh, um uh the pond if you know what i mean they they know where it is and uh, even in intense arable right in the middle if you've restored a pond in the middle so that ghost pond that you know you guy you guys have done in the middle of a field they'll find that and they'll find it quickly so I think, you know, there's no need to put the bat boxes really close by, you know, um, but, you know, work on the pond and they'll find it. So, so how far can bats go in a night then? Uh, I, I couldn't tell you that, but okay. what, what we've noticed in, in the work that we've, we've done is that the, um, you can sit by the, we sit, we sit by the pond at, dark, at dusk, you know, and we've got these protectors sort of, you know, um, monitoring, you know, so we, but it's just nice just to watch, you know, at dusk, see whether, see whether they come in. And we found that uh, at the restored ponds, you know, um, it, it, there's like a just a sudden moment. They all arrive, you know, on mass. It's almost like they've come out of a roost wherever it is and they arrive on mass and then they stay there, you know, and they're feeding. You can see they're feeding uh, for, you know, several hours, you know, so it's until you have to go to bed. Wow. <laughs> that is, sounds quite, quite a spectacle. <laughs> um. Brill. So, um, and the second question is probably more towards yourself again, Carl. How, how, um, how do you work out how deep a pond should be? I think you, it, it's, there's no, there's no, there's no sort of set depth really. Um, the key thing is if you're restoring a pond, is dig the pond out to how deep it used to be. But as I said, never, never take out the clay. And um, and do see leave some of that mud in the bottom, some of that older mud. But I, I would say take a chance to get out as much as possible. Um, you know, so your pond might be a metre deep, two metres deep, two and a half metres deep. It, you know, just whatever it needs to be. So follow the contours of the pond and and restore it, really. And if you, if you do what each pond wants, if you like, then all your ponds are different. They're all unique. So, that, you know, there's no one formula, if you know what I mean. It's best not to be. Yeah. 
no that that's how and on on the pond depth just something i saw in the pictures of your ponds as well and something that we recommend from a turtle dove perspective the edges at least if they could be a bit shallow and have a sort of a soft margin to them in places certainly for turtle dove feeding it enables access yeah so i think uh, if you're restoring an old pond it's very important not to change it because it always damages it and what you'll find is that, that you'll on a, on a farm if there's lots of ponds around some there'll be shallow margins in different places and there'll be deeper deep really steep slopes i think if you just restore what there is and don't try and change it you'll have all these different sorts of slopes if you go with a formula we need to have shallow slopes mm -hmm. then you'll have shallow slopes all over the place and you won't have the variety but the key thing really why why i say don't change it and is because what we've found in on farmland is that if you these bits of old ponds these old banks of old ponds sometimes you know been in around for around the landscape for centuries they often harbour really quite rare plants so you'll find early purple orchids nice patches of um ancient woodland stuff and of course if you scrape that away you'll never you don't they don't return and you don't know that you don't know you've lost them because they're never there so yeah that's uh, hopefully that answers that <laughs> yeah no that certainly does S stick to what was there <laughs> yeah ideally but if you if you're doing a ghost pond then take your chance to get shallows because you can never know what it was like. So take your chance to do the shallow. And if you're creating a new pond, definitely have some shallows. Yeah, it's a great, a great thing to do. Super. Well, thank you, Carl. Um, so yeah, keep the questions coming in if anybody has any, any other things to ask. Um, we've got a couple more here. Um, so what this is kind of an open to all, really, but um, what's the first thing a farmer should do if they're wanting to look after the watercourses on farm, thinking about both for biodiversity on the farm and for reducing pollution? And this, I we've heard say, from Emma and Carl, so yeah, Philippa, if we could start start with you on yeah, that. Yeah, I think start start with your soil. If you get your soil right, then, um, you know, you're preventing a lot of pollution. And, and keeping it in place so yeah avoid trafficking it trafficking it too much with heavy machinery um and um you know tr try ways of building up the soil organic matter whether it's using cover crops or introducing livestock into rotation putting organic manures on um and um yeah try and get get that diversity back into the system um and look look for pinch points where it's running off and then in your farmyards, fix your gutters, separate the clean and dirty water and, and deal with the with the dirty water, the contaminated water separately from the clean water drains. Oh, thank you. Uh, that, so this is one of my questions now. I saw in your graphs you had, I mentioned it earlier with the different, it looked like you had different cover crop mixes. So what would, you, for water quality, what would you recommend are the better cover crop mixes to use? It's good to have a mixture, actually. So different things are good for different things. So something like a tiller radish is really good for like breaking through like compacted soil uh, and then improving like the, the soil structure and then subsequent crops will take up the nutrients better. Um, but if it, it's quite useful to have things like rye in there for scavenging the um, the, nit the nitrogen and growing it within the crop itself. Um, so you know a mixture of that and um, yeah different things like clovers and other legumes that can also um, later on at least they can fix some fix some nitrogen but also it is they're all giving a variety of of plant structures above and below the ground so they will all work and break up the soil in different ways yeah well, thank you, Philippa. Um, right, we've got a, a few questions now, so I'm going to move on from there. Um, from Eliza, um, is there anything water related that you'd want to do in the North Essex Farmer Cluster which you haven't found a funding pot for yet? Hmm, that's a good question, isn't it? I think we're fortunate where we are for most of our catchment because we have the water companies interested in getting involved in river related work that is filling in some of the gaps where other funding pots can't. So some of the ponds that you saw in that um, 
drone footage as we went up the river uh, some of the ponds that we're working on as part of that project are in fact connected to land drains or ditches um, so in terms of biodiversity they are not as ideal as a pond that is not connected to the drainage system but we are able to create those uh, attenuation ponds essentially because of their water holding potential and um, because of trapping silt slowing down the flow of water from the farmland into the river which are all sort of objectives um, which our water companies are looking to support um, and also the environment agency from a kind of river management perspective so that's really been really helpful for us but that doesn't apply for our whole river catchment because once we get past the last drinking water abstraction point the farmers at that end of the catchment where most uh, their river water and anything that's coming off their farms is going straight out into the estuary it's harder to fund those types of projects there um but we are pretty excited about some of the offers that are coming through from SFI and stewardship and um, this most recent kind of round of offers. There's some real opportunities in there to, to work alongside water courses through some of those offers. Can you think of anything water related that we can't fund at the minute that we would like to be able to do? Not that we've come across so far, I would say, no. No, that's been quite a healthy, healthily funded um, side of the project up here. No. Oh, that's that's good to hear. Um, there has, I mean, you've mentioned it there as well about um, ponds with drainage. Um, and I think that's quite, it's quite an interesting one. A few people saying like, is there any value in restoring drainage ponds? Mm. Um, so you guys mentioned on like the yeah, sort of I mean, value. Yeah, a lot of our ponds on arable fields are, yeah, so in, in Essex and our landscape, they're slightly different to some of the ponds Um that Carl's got in Norfolk, we've probably got less grassland and less grassland ponds, but um, obviously the value is there. You can use the same formula. We've um, we've got ponds that are connected to drainage ditches that are just full of bats and insects and uh, kingfishers on the pond and all sorts of things. So they are used uh, by wildlife and have a benefit. Um, it's probably they're going to be lacking the sort of um, rare aquatic plants and things perhaps because of the nutrient levels in the water but there are loads of things that do survive in the water anyway um, and and yeah and they have a natural flood management um, use for the landscape so yes there's definitely value in them and it's just whether you can get funding for that pond and that is probably like Emma said it's just if you're upstream of someone trying to abstract water from it and the turbidity of the water and stuff is causing them a huge expense, then there probably is the funding available. Um, but that's a bit of a postcode lottery, I'm afraid. Yeah. Carl, have you got any further thoughts on that? I think we're still we're learning all the time, really. But uh, uh, all I say is that um, the best ponds, and this is this is really, really well accepted. It's so well known, you know, in my field, are always the ones that um, have clean, that have the cleanest water. They'll always be the best for biodiversity. But as you say, you know, that um, you take your chances, I think. And uh, we've still got probably got a lot to learn, really, about the value of ponds that are, are connected. You know, I'm, I'm interested in learning more. But, you know, if I had the ideal situation, I'd I'd, I'd disconnect, you know, and uh, and go for those ponds that aren't, aren't connected. Yeah. yeah. But biodiversity, I mean, there are, there are other things you, you we're doing it for as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it, isn't it? It's recognizing the different, the importance of ponds and functioning for so many different things, um, and what what you want that what that pond can deliver best, um, within a catchment and within your farm. Um, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I agree, with Carl. You know, for biodiversity within the pond itself, obviously, you want you want clean water, but there might be cases, you know, as Emma and Joe have explained, where you might want an attenuation pond. You can get sediment ponds and traps in in country stewardship funded through that. Um, or you might want earth banks or or buns that will just stop that sediment going to the river as a kind of last resort, really, and then enable the water to kind of um, go into the into the field before it gets to the river and the sediment to kind of settle out. So, and that's really protecting the biodiversity within the river itself or the stream or wherever that's going. So, yeah, we must, you know, so for those purposes, we can also use like water holding features. They might be small, might just be swales or, um, you know, in, in ditch dams or whatever um, 
or, or sediment traps in the corners of fields, whatever. But yeah, they're not going to be the biodiversity ponds that um that uh, that Carl's explained, but they do have a different function. Mm, yeah. Um so I think there's there's one more topic that I'm going to group from a few questions here. Um, but before we go on to that one, um while still on ponds, there's someone talking about um, the issues of too much, too wet and too dry and thinking about larger storage bodies for irrigation purposes and that sort of future proofing. Um, is there funding available for that? And um, I don't know, if, Carl, if you've got any thoughts about potential biodiversity for, value for those sorts of ponds as well. I, could, I, I definitely love to make a comment on them. I always think... Um... You know, there's there's a there's a, there is that real need to have water. You know, um, and irrigation water. You know, it's it's a, it's essential in some cases. You know, but I'd love to see them designed differently. You know, the the, the way that they are at the minute, they're sort of square, and they're up on a hill. You know, and they're the big banks, and and they're steep. You know, I just I, I thought a great opportunity there with um, irrigation reservoirs that we were just to dig like the old like we did in the old days, like a lake. With shallow margins and if it draws down the drawdown down so you know the drawdown zone of a lake is an incredibly biodiverse place. So I think I think they you know we could if, we, if they were designed really well they'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah, that would. <laughs> I just so throw great. that out there. That's, um, a, that's a big ask. That is, that's going to change <laughs> the world a bit. But yeah, Philippa, could we fund that? There are there are funds available through the Farm Resilience Fund, um, which is another DEFRA grant, um, a productivity type grant. Um, so for for large reservoirs, and then there's um, yeah smaller grants are going to come available through Farm Equipment and Technology Fund uh, that can help think irrigation type things as well. So equipment. So yeah, there are options, and I think. I think we're looking at the, it's kind of the problem at two ends of the scale, really, isn't it? So, uh, you know, the flooding that we get and, and the more extreme weather conditions, is like more heavier, shorter bursts of, of, of heavy rain, but also drier and higher temperatures we're, looking, we're facing properly in the future. So, and, and we're starting to see that now. So, um, uh, but it's all, we want to kind of keep as much in the soil as we can that that is the key thing is is you know whatever whether it's we've got flooding problems or whether we've got drought problems actually it's it's making sure that our soils are hold, holding the water um and not water not waterlogged but actually just within their structure so they can be taken up by plants and, and can drain as well I mean, so yeah. yes exactly yeah so um and all the yeah and and looking at the whole landscape um you know and how that's holding water whether you've got moss in the uplands or whatever, or lichens in the uplands, they can be amazing for storing water. But yeah, I think, yeah, in terms of irrigation and just water resources, definitely need to look at, um, uh, at reservoirs and irrigation ponds, particularly in the east. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I've, I'd better stick to one last question, otherwise I will get told off. Um, <laughs> and this is heading over to you guys, Emma and Joe, and the farmer cluster. Um, so does your farm cluster have a membership fee? Um, how do you fund your oper core operational costs? And like, how does that work? Okay, so we've been um, quite lucky, I think because Essex was a little bit behind on having farmer clusters compared to a lot of the other counties, certainly in the eastern region. Um, but there was lots of interest in funding the startup costs for a farm cluster here. So the first two years kind of operational cost, uh, costs paying coordinator and to kickstart some of these projects, that has been core funded by a combination of funders. So the, the county council have put money in for that, the Environment Agency, Essex and Suffolk Water, Anglian Water and the RSPB all contributed to that initial startup cost. Um, we're not at the moment looking at a membership cost. At the moment, it's free for members to join the North Essex Farm Cluster. Um, and that's we want to be as inclusive as possible. And we want the farm cluster to prove it has a benefit before we even think about looking at a membership option. So our kind of funding for our 
uh, next kind of three to five years is going to be likely a combination of building uh, costs into project applications. And when we're applying to funding, um, we'll have a coordinating a project coordinator uh, budget line in that to cover our kind of core costs. And then also looking um, at bringing on board funded for a second two year period um hope you know asking them you know we've got the farm cluster up and going and seeing if they'll really support us to take it forward now our membership's growing so we've got something like eighteen thousand hectares along the catchment that have signed up for the farm cluster in this first 18 months so we think the appetite's there um and so we're just kind of using that size to say that this is the kind of community that we've got and that we're working together um and seeing who's willing to invest in that really to to secure its future yeah exciting times um lots of farmers wanting to work together and it's it's great that it, it is accessible as well um i i am sorry i haven't got through all the questions but i know some of the um philippa and carl whilst we've been answering that one have been typing some answers away and we will um so thank you to you two for that and we will also on those typed up answers we'll share them on the um after the event to everybody who is registered um a quick plug that next week we've got a our second webinar um which is looking at funding available um and sort of financing nature friendly farming um and planning habitat management and all of those sorts of things so stepping away from water and looking at the whole whole farming system and i hope that you can join us for that and then on the 13th of March, we are getting a little bit, honing a little bit more on the work that we're doing at Hope Farm, looking at our carbon farming project and carbon friendly farming um, joined up with uh, some um, fantastic research that we'll be hearing about from the Game of Wildlife Conservation Trust, as well as our um, work on carbon calculators and agroforestry um, here at Hope Farm. So thank you. Yeah, thank you again for joining. Thank you very much to the speakers and to all the guys behind the scenes who have helped to um, help to run this event as well and catch up with you all soon.